13.2 picks up with eukaryotic organisms. We know that prokaryotes evolved slowly over time, and from the evidence we have, we also know that eventually they lived in groups, meaning like clumps or clusters of cells. And how it appears is that individual cells eventually developed one another to spread the work out. If you live in a house and there are 18 chores that need to be done, it's way easier to accomplish those chores if six people tackle three tasks. That's kind of how the endosymbiotic theory worked. Certain organisms developed processes to do certain functions better than others. Well, if you could just live in the same house or survive inside the same membrane as someone else who had better traits than you, you could take over certain tasks, they could take over certain tasks, and everyone would benefit. What we find in modern eukaryotic cells is that some of our traits seem to be archaeal in history. They seem to have come from archaea. And some of our traits are shared by bacteria. So it looks like at one point in time, different prokaryotes were brought together within the same cellular structure, lived in harmony essentially, and kept propagating that life form. This is a transmission electron micrograph of a mitochondria in a mammalian lung cell. Eukaryotic cells can have anywhere from a few mitochondria to a few thousand mitochondria. When we look at mitochondria, there's some interesting things to discuss. One, they have their own DNA. Two, they copy themselves through the process of binary fission. And three, they have their own membranes. If you'll remember, hopefully, from the cellular respiration chapter, mitochondria have an internal membrane and an external membrane. The internal membrane is made by the mitochondria itself from its own DNA, while the external membrane matches that of the cell in which it lives. The mitochondria was once a free-living organelle. Technically, we should call it a free-living organism. It was engulfed by a cell who realized if it simply fed the mitochondria the oxygen that it desired, it would consistently spit out ATP, which is what the host cell needed. They've lived in harmony ever since. The endosymbiotic theory tells us that organisms that undergo the photosynthetic process went through a very similar envelopment procedure. First, you had kind of a proto-eukaryotic cell, and it created its own organelles by creating kind of invaginations of its own plasma membrane in order to make specialized packets where events could occur. In some point in time, the prokaryote enveloped the bacteria that became a mitochondria and later on some of those new eukaryotic organisms that have mitochondria also enveloped a photosynthetic bacteria and that's why you find mitochondria in both plants and animals but only chloroplast in organisms that can undergo photosynthesis so some of the protists that we know and plant cells. Speaking of protists, let's start talking about them. Protists range from microscopic, single-celled, teeny tiny little cells to the huge kelp forests that grow for hundreds of feet in our oceans. Some of the characteristics of protists or things to note about in protists, they are incredibly diverse. A protist is essentially any eukaryotic organism we found that is obviously not a plant, animal, or fungus. Evolutionary lineages of protists are examined on a daily basis and continue to be debated and kind of explored. There are about 100,000 described living species of protists, but because a lot of them live in symbiotic relationships with other organisms, there's a gigantic potential for protist diversity, and we haven't even touched on it. Most of them do live in some sort of aquatic environment, including freshwater or saltwater, damp soil, and some of them even thrive in snow. The snow is enough water for them. Some of them are parasites that infect animals or plants, so technically they're not living in water, but they are living inside of a creature that is filled with water. 
protists have a lot of different ways that they can go about bringing food sources uh, into themselves. Some of them undergo photosynthesis, some of them are heterotrophic, some of them are both, and we call them mixotrophs. Just as a reminder, here are the different stages of phagocytosis. So in phagocytosis, food particles can actually be reached out and grabbed by pseudopods, which means false feet and brought inside the organism and wrapped up in a food vacuole where it's met with a lysosome or met with a lysosome. The lysosome will release all of its digestive enzymes into that food vacuole, break down everything that it needs, and then spit out the rest on the other side. We split prokaryotes, or excuse me, we split protists into six huge eukaryotic supergroups Plants, animals, and fungi all fit within these, as you'll see as you look through the ch as you look through the book. Their names are Excavata, Chromioalveolata, Rhizaria, Archaeoplastida, Amoebozoa, and Opisticanta. You'll notice that both fungi and animals are in that last group, while plants are in the Archidia Plastida group. We split them up in this fashion. These Everyone listed in these six eukaryotic supergroups appear to have had the same eukaryotic ancestor. Now, they've all diverged from one another quite drastically since then, but they all at least appear to have that ancestor. We tend to study the protists that cause illness more than any of the other protists. This is an example of one of those such individuals. This is a plasmodium, all those dark purple dots. This particular plasmodium is what causes malaria. Malaria is thought to have killed about 1 million people since 2010. The vast majority of them are young African children. A lot of time and energy has gone into disrupting the life cycle of these plasmodiums because these creatures, these little, these little protists, spend some of their life cycles in human beings and then some of their life cycles in the guts of mosquitoes and that's actually how we get it is by being bitten by an infected mosquito so we tend to find there's far more research and far more knowledge when it comes to the protists that cause human disease another example are the trypanosomes these cause african sleeping sickness which you have a lot of physical symptoms with African sleeping sickness prior to the neurological symptoms that can be quite devastating, but you can see these kind of ribbon-like, worm-like protist parasites floating among the red blood cells of this infected individual. So again, this is one of those protists where you're going to find massive amounts of information, while in the case of other protists, it seems like we don't really know anything about them at all other than what they look like where whoever found them found them and what name it is that they decided to give them. There's some helpful protists, thankfully, just like before. Don't hate the protists, just like we shouldn't hate the prokaryotes. They are the base of the food chain in most oceanic environments. Coral polyps obtain their nutrient through a symbolic relationship, or um, symbiotic, excuse me, a relationship with dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are a specific type of protists. And they also help us with decomposition. So they recycle a lot of nutrients in our environment for us and keep the food chain going. The last section of this chapter goes over fungi. There are about 100,000 species of fungi on Earth, and that's only a fraction of the 1 million species that we suspect. Fungi come in the forms of edible mushrooms, yeast, black mold, and penicillium notum, which is where we get uh, penicillin, the antibiotic from. Fungi are eukaryotes. They're not capable of photosynthesis. They can undergo sexual or asexual reproduction. A lot of the times when they're undergoing sexual reproduction, they produce an incredible amount of spores that are disseminated by the wind. It's actually kind of neat to see. Many fungi are decomposers. They help to clean up our environment and again, recycle nutrients. They have a lot of interaction with other species. Some of it's beneficial, some of it's parasitic, and some of it is infectious in nature. They have incredible variability in their physical form. So you have kind of your typical, like when you say the word mushroom, you might think of Mario Brothers for one, but what you see in A, some of them have these really pretty bright fruiting bodies like you see in B, and some of them are really tiny. You find them mixed into soil, and they can actually be a little hard to identify without the help of a microscope. 
Fungal cells have complex organization. Some of them have plasmids, just like the bacteria that we talked about. They do contain mitochondria, but they don't have any chloroplasts. Their cell walls are pretty thick and contain complex polysaccharides, chitin and glycan, but they don't have any cellulose, which is what we find in plants. So that helps differentiate them from typical plant cells. They do have normal plasma membranes, so what you would expect to find in an animal, but they're stabilized a lot more by special steroid molecules. Fungi are also not typically modal, so they can't move around, but they do have flagella on the gametes in some of the specific groups of fungi. When we discuss their growth and reproduction, we look at a vegetative body usually, and then like a reproductive body. The vegetative body of the fungus, we refer to that part of the fungus as the thallus. It can be unicellular or multicellular. We also though can look at unicellular fungi that we just call yeasts. So there's a lot of variability in the fungus group, just like there was in the protist group. The vast majority of fungi are multicellular and they have those two distinct stages where they can be either vegetative or reproductive, but we don't always see that, but we'll look at some examples. Fungi tend to thrive in environments that are moist and just a little bit acidic. They can grow with or without light. Remember, they don't have chloroplasts, so they're not dependent on it, but they do vary on their oxygen requirements, which might be why it's helpful to have light, because that means that other plants are around you producing it. As previously mentioned, they can reproduce sexually or asexually. Giant puffball mushrooms are some of the fun ones to explore and kind of to witness because that giant puffball will eventually burst and it releases this huge cloud of spores when it reaches maturity. So in all honesty, some of the fun parts in studying fungi is just watching what they can do. They obtain their nutrition in really interesting ways. They're heterotrophic, so they have to eat their food, but digestion takes place before ingestion, which is kind of nuts. So we refer to fungi as saprobes, which means that they derive their nutrients from decaying matter. So what they do is they, they put out digestive juices into the environment around them and the digestive enzymes kind of do their work and then the fungus will absorb the digested material into itself and take in the nutrients. So it's really different, but fungi fulfill a very important ecological role and have a lot of potential uses for bioremediation because they're great at removing harmful substances from an environment. You'll see some different divisions of fungi just depending on how the classifications were made, but usually what you end up looking at are the citrids, conjugated fungi, sac fungi, club fungi, and then imperfect fungus. So they have kind of those broad categories that we also saw in the protists. Fungal pathogens tend to be of great interest. We have, of course, mold that occurs on fruits. Anyone who's ever bought fruit has found a moldy pear or something. There are some funguses that grow on grapes specifically and can affect the wine market. And there's powdery mildews that infect plants, but we tend to be most worried about the molds and things that grow on wheat crops and corn crops or crops that feed large number of large numbers of people. So that's where a lot of our research dollars go when it comes to studying fungi. There are, of course, infections in human beings. Here you can see a ringworm infection. There is, uh, in, in B, this is a fungus that can grow on your scalp. So it looks a little bit like dandruff, but it grows in thick mats rather than just flaky skin. And then, of course, we have uh, a fungal infection from an Ascomycota species that can grow in human beings' lungs, and you think you have the flu, but you actually have a fungus growing in your lungs. We'll end on the note where, of course, not all fungi are bad. They come from, or they help with food resources. The funguses themselves can be food, or they can, inf they can partake in environmental partnerships. So fungi can be important because they can help different plants absorb nitrogen, uh, nitrogen or water resources into their roots. 
there are special types of fungi that grow with all of the corn that you have ever eaten. Fungi can help in fermentation, of course, everyone knows about yeast. And finally, some funguses like that we started talking about, the one that helps us to grow penicillin, can be very, very important in modern medications. So up next, you should read your chapter. There's a whole lot of detail in this one, so make sure that you take notes and draw pictures, consider a lot of resources, and then take a crack at your homework.